Pete and I looked at each other and just said, something just happened to us, didn't it? And we still can't remember which one of us said that when we ask each other, but we know one of us said that because we both felt it. And I had this sense that I'm a farm girl and, you know, I'm a fixer. Yes. So I wanted to fix <laughs> this problem. And I wanted to get her out of that apartment, get rid of that boyfriend, get her a job. I was just wanted to fix it. And I very distinctly heard God say to me, not in words, words. but in thought, don't rescue her, be her friend. Because if I had done all that, she would have been in the same situation 60 days later. Welcome to the Intertwined Life Podcast. I am your host, Jenny Zentz. I am a wife and a mom on a mission. I've got a passion to help women discover practical ways to apply the power of God's word to our everyday stuff. I truly believe that our walks with the Lord should be seamlessly intertwined with our everyday lives. It should affect every move we make and every breath we take. So come on, let's do life together. You've got this, cause he's got you. Hey, hey, everybody, welcome to the Intertwined Life Podcast. This is Jenny, and I am so glad that you are here. If this is your first time tuning into the show, welcome. I am so glad that you found us, and I hope that you love what you hear, and I really believe you're going to. I'm excited because today kicks off a very special five-part series featuring real-life people that are enacting real change in the lives of homeless moms with children. For the next five weeks, we're going to be talking with individuals involved in all facets of the life-changing not-for-profit ministry, New Life Mission. New Life Mission is really right here in my own backyard. They are right here in Brevard County, Florida, on Florida's Space Coast. And my family and I have been involved in different facets with New Life Mission, which was formerly known as Brevard Rescue Mission for 10 years prior to changing their name and having a rebranding about a year ago. So some of you listening who are local may be aware or familiar with New Life Mission, formerly Brevard Rescue Mission. And some of you may be on the other side of the world and have never heard of this before, but I promise you that regardless of where in the world you are, you, these stories are going to inspire you as we see how listening to the gentle tugging of the Holy Spirit on our hearts can lead us into a life of more power and purpose and impact than we could ever imagine had we planned it for ourselves, right? That is Proverbs 16, 9, one of my favorite verses, man has a lot of plans, but God directs his steps. And I am so thankful for that powerful promise in scripture. And just to give you a quick introduction to New Life Mission, through a Christ-centered environment, they exist to equip homeless moms to transform their families for generations. Through education and accountability and goal achievement, their Total Transformation Program empowers families to become self-sufficient and break the cycle of homelessness. In part one here today of this series, we're going to be talking with the founder and CEO, Ms. Stacia Glavez. You are going to hear the story of how it all started when a practically homeless mom collapsed in Stacia's front yard back in 2006. And now, 15 years later and hundreds of lives later, countless families have been forever changed. So sit back, enjoy this conversation with Stacia, and please, please, please do not forget to check in each Wednesday for the next five weeks, because each Wednesday, a new person and a new story and more and more powerful, powerful stories of God's transforming power in the lives of homeless moms and children, but also in those who work there and those who support them. So now, without further ado, here is my interview with Miss Stacia Glavez. Okay, welcome, Miss Stacia Glavas, to the Intertwined Life Podcast. I'm excited to be here with you, Jenny. I'm so glad you are. I have been having you on my list since I started doing interviews, thinking I definitely want to have Stacia on, so I'm glad that this has worked out. I am excited to share you and your story with my listeners. Stacia is the CEO and founder of an amazing nonprofit right here in our own backyard, and the organization is called New Life Mission. It is located here on the Space Coast of Brevard County, Florida, and I'm so excited to have Stacia share her inspiring story of 
well, I'm going to let her talk about it. <laughs> I'm going to let her explain what she's doing and what the Lord's put in her heart. And also just the incredible impact that the organization of New Life Mission is having in our community. So Stacia, before we start rolling with all the really good stuff, why don't you just introduce yourself a little bit? Tell us a little about you personally, your hobbies, your family, where you live, just who is Stacia? Sure. Uh, that's actually a loaded question. I've had a lot of lives. Uh, grew up on a farm in Oklahoma and ended up going to Washington, D.C. to work for my senator from Oklahoma. <clears throat> met my husband who worked for him there, who was also from Oklahoma, but we met in Washington. I then uh, got my MBA uh, at George Washington University with focus on international trade, and I worked on the Hill for a while, and then as an international trade consultant, and then started my own small business of a franchise called Made Brigade. I was a franchisee, started with my three employees, and it grew and grew, and then our family grew and grew, and then I had three daughters, and then my husband took over the business because I was exhausted and too <laughs> stretched, and by then it was making money to, you know, afford our family uh, income, and so he took over the business, and then I was with the kids and doing community things and still involved in the business a, a little bit, but then moved more into ministry and felt called into ministry, mm -hmm. so I started seminary. Uh, in Washington, the D.C., at Wesley Theological Seminary, and then <clears throat> decided to follow the dream that my husband had had since before we ever had kids, which is he wanted to live on a sailboat and travel <laughs> with children. Oh, that's awesome. And, and we're from a landlocked state of Oklahoma, yes. you know, so I just thought it was a wackiest idea, but he had read stories, <laughs> wanted to do it. So we ended up selling our house and our cars and had our friends come over and buy our furniture oh my gosh. and then we moved onto a sailboat and traveled for two years and homeschooled the kids and we ended up landing in Brevard County by boat it wasn't uh, like a shipwreck or anything no right? it was <laughs> land we we docked uh safely at Talamar Bay Marina down in Indian Harbor Beach and oh, wow. so um and the idea was I was gonna I wanted to finish seminary and I had discovered a seminary in Orlando well the Orlando campus of Asbury Theological Seminary which is actually based in Wilmore Kentucky and really felt called to their philosophy of where where head and heart meet hand in hand so it was really about not the only knowledge of theology but the heart of what it means and connecting with people so I uh, ended up finishing my Master's of Divinity at Asbury, and during that time, uh, we ha I met a near homeless woman in front of my house in Rockledge, <clears throat> and she and her little baby, about 15 months old, uh, were kind of near our house and then walked in front of our house, and she collapsed, the mom collapsed, and so Pete ran over to check on her. She was having an asthma attack. So he came in and got me. We went out and realized that she just lived a few blocks away. So we got her in our vehicle, drove her home, and found out that she was had gotten out of a car with a dangerous kind of boyfriend who was doing road rage with somebody, and it get scared her, and then it prompted the asthma attack. So when we were in her little apartment, which was about three blocks from our house, but what I use the term is a world away, there was mold falling in from the ceiling, it was just one of the nastiest business, uh, things that we had been in. And I was in the cleaning business for a long time. So I've seen a lot of dirty houses. <laughs> this was really, really unhealthy environment. And so uh, we prayed with her. Uh, we helped, or I have asthma myself. So I knew how to help, you, help her with her nebulizer treatment. Uh, my husband, Pete, played with the baby. And so we just kind of got things settled down and ended up getting back in the car after we were probably there 30 minutes maybe at the most what year was this Stacia? 2006 okay so yeah this happened in 2006 and so when we left that her apartment that day Pete and I looked at each other and just said something just happened to us didn't it mm -hmm. and we still can't remember which one of us said that when we asked each other but we know one of us said that because we both felt it and so then the next day I opened the front door and there was a little piece of paper uh, just torn out of a notebook paper, a notepad that said in handwriting, I hope that God will bless you for doing your good deeds and how I want to thank your helping hands in my time of need. God has given you open eyes to help the world to see that compassion and empathy are the actions that has bonded you to me. Thank oh. you, love, Julia and Amelia. Hmm. 
we were just blown away from that. I mean, just the fact that she could write such beautiful poetry, that she had her heart there, that felt like God was in this. So then the next uh, day, I just went by to check on her, took some diapers and formula and just to see how she was doing. She was fine. And that day I got back in my car and I had this sense that I'm a farm girl and, you know, I'm a fixer. Yes. So I wanted to <laughs> fix this problem. And I wanted to get her out of that apartment, get rid of that boyfriend, get her a job. I was just wanting to fix it. And I very distinctly heard God say to me, not in words, sure. but in thought, don't rescue her, be her friend. Because if I had done all that, she would have been in the same situation 60 days later. Yeah. Yeah. So that's when I just started a journey with her, uh, picking her up and taking her to McDonald's to breakfast, which was kind of her world that she was used to. And eventually we became friends. And then I started inviting her to come to church with me. And then I found out she had an, an older daughter that was with a different biological dad mm -hmm. from before and <clears throat> just heard the, a horrible life that she had lived growing up terrible abuse from lots of corners, um, drugs, abortions, just the whole nine yards. And yet she had a Christian grandmother mm -hmm. and had taken her to vacation Bible school and had planted that seed with her. So when we got to know each other and she started going to church, she just really became in love with the Lord and turned her life around. She ended up getting married, <clears throat> moving to Texas, uh, her younger daughter, Ended up, we were able to get her back to her mom's custody. And those two daughters just thrived. Uh, one of them is already in, is in college now. And the other one is in high school. And they're both just thriving. And they were both not thriving in 2006. I'm telling you that. It was awful. So I, that family has become part of our family now. Yeah. Julia's her name. And that those girls just mean the world to me. And so we still see each other and keep in touch really regularly. And so then as I was finishing seminary in 2009 or 2008, I was about a year away and uh, was also working as an assistant pastor in the area. And I, I had another one of those epiphany moments where I felt like God was saying to me, instead of you going into the pastoral ministry, I want you to do for others what I taught you to do for Julia. I wrote that down. What does this mean? I talked to professors and mentors and pastors and friends and my husband, of course, <laughs> and just got 100% confirmation that this is where my ministry was supposed to go. So uh, we went from there and birthed, at that time, it was called Brevard Rescue Mission. Yes, I was definitely going <laughs> to gonna touch on that because we've got people local listening and people around the country, maybe even around the world. And exactly. the Brevard Rescue Mission has to be mentioned because that's who you were for a decade, right? right? Exactly. But we, we use the term nine out of 10. It might be 99 out of 100 people through the years. As we've said to people that, you know, I, we work for Brevard Rescue Mission, they would say, oh, I love animals. <laughs> but they thought we rescued pets. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that's a, also a wonderful cause, and we love animals too, but that's not what we were called yeah. to in this ministry. So yeah. we went through a rebranding about a year ago and uh, more closely identified the name with who we are and what we do is transforming homeless families uh, with the name New Life Mission. Excellent. Excellent. Man, Stacia, your story is I love your story. There's so much in there that I didn't even know. So I've known Stacia for a few years now, and my family had the privilege of working in different capacities off and on with formerly Brevard Rescue Mission, now New Life Mission. But there's so many things in your story I had not heard. I don't know if you know, but I worked on the Hill for a while, and my husband and I met in D.C. I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we actually met in D.C. Actually, at church, we met in D.C. I on that. Yeah, so that's so neat. Um, what I love about your story is I've always just seen it as an really inspiring example of how that following the pool of the Lord on your heart can lead us down a path that is more amazing and more purposeful and impactful than we would have ever imagined had we planned our own path, right? And it always makes me think of uh, Proverbs 16, 9, where it says, man has a lot of plans, but the Lord directs his path, right? <laughs> yeah. And I think there's a lot of release in that for I, you and I are probably pretty similar personalities, a little type A, go get it, fix the problem, right? Yep. And I remember the pressure of what am I going to do with my life? I have to figure it all out, you know? And when I 
found that verse, it was like, oh, I can take a breath. I can make plans, but God's got this if I'm seeking him. And I love how your story showed us that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Just about how that following that call, whether it's for you personally or for other people, how we stay sensitive to the leading of the spirit to be led in our everyday lives and just how that can change everything. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I get asked a lot about like, I wish I knew what my ministry was. I wish I knew what my ministry, like, you know, what yours is. And I, you know, yes, something kind of drastic happened to me in my life to have this big shift. And, but when I look back at my life, everything I was doing led to this. So what the story I just told you sounded like a drastic moment. The fact that I grew up on a farm and I know how to fix stuff, mm -hmm. literally, I mean, plumbing, you know, I just have a sense. I just know kind of some mechanical things, a lot of leadership opportunities early on. I, you know, grew up in this farming community. So I was in 4-H and FFA and FHA. I was the state president of the Future Homemakers of America in <laughs> Oklahoma. I spent half of my senior year speaking around the state Wow. Uh, at other schools. And so and then, you know, leading a statewide organization and then my business, my political experience and my dad had been in the state Senate in Oklahoma and then I worked in Congress. So I had that whole political kind of background and understanding economics, you know, both a business degree and then later seminary degree and then the opportunity to work in ministry. And I was, you know, serving as a pastor for a while. I've worked with youth. I've done music ministry. Um, and then, you know, as a business person, of course, I've no accounting and marketing and legal and finance and, uh, got, you know, all those sorts of things. So it's like, I, I never would have thought it was all heading to this, yeah. but now when you go, you go, oh, wow. Yeah. It was this, then this, then this, then this, mm -hmm. then this, then this. It actually wasn't as big of a jump as you think. Yeah. We can connect those dots when we look in retrospect, right? right. How God was planning it the whole time. So while I never would have imagined this, I see how God used everything, you know, in my life uh, to get to this. So I think it's not always trying to seek God of give me my big answer. It's what's my answer today? And how, do I, how can I be faithful today and next week, whether it's my Bible study, my prayer time, my relationships with other people, and just, just relaxing into your day, into who God is in your life and just kind of trusting that you're in your ministry now. Mm -hmm. This is part of your ministry now, even if you can't see it. Yes. Yes. Oh yeah. That's so good. Cause you're absolutely right. And we have to focus on the next right thing as Elizabeth Elliott used to say, right? Like where we are plugging in where we are listening to him step-by-step step and day by day, and then trusting that he is ordering our steps. And I felt like he told me once, you know, I'm not going to let you miss or mess up the plans I have for you. If you're earnestly seeking me. It's like, Absolutely. he is our focus, yep. right? He's going to direct those steps. And now, I do think we miss things. I mean, I look oh, yeah. back, I've made mistakes in my life. Sure. God just weaves us back into the plan. Exactly. Sometimes the reason that things happen is because I made a mistake, that mm -hmm. I was stupid. <laughs> wrong. Sure. And God did not desire me to make that mistake. Yeah. God does not plan every mistake. He plans good for us. And we, as in the human condition, we make mistakes. But as long as we kind of keep coming back, he continues to weave us back into his plan. And he, the, you know, the Romans 8, 28, he works good for those that are called according to his purpose. So he continues to turn good out of bad. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. Out of good. You know, he's always alive and working in us. Or he allows our mistakes and then he uses our mistakes, right? Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. I want to circle back a little bit because we do have a lot of people listening who have heard this story. It's an incredible story, but now they're thinking, okay, but what is New Life Mission? Right. And so let's say there's probably several people listening who know what you do and what that stands for, but there's a lot of people who maybe this is their first hearing of it ever. So what's your elevator speech, right? If someone comes up to you and they say, what is New Life Mission? How do you shoot straight with them and tell them exactly what it is you guys do? We transform homeless families for generations to come. Mm. So we're taking homeless women with children and taking them to a four, through a four-phase process, a residential, they, so we have places that they live with us through a one- to two-year program that provides everything they need to attain self-sufficiency, to be able to support their families and have the confidence back and the ability to move forward in their lives. So <clears throat> women might come from all kinds of backgrounds. We're not, we're not a domestic violence shelter. 
We're not a recovery facility, but we might, we do have residents from all of those backgrounds. And we're actually calling them students now. That's another thing we've done in this past year, switching from residents to students, because it conveys and they become, they start as a freshman and go all the way through senior and then graduate. So they see themselves as progressing forward in the program. So if they come in without a high school degree, the first job they have is full time at nine to five, Monday through Friday is studying for that GED and we have volunteer tutors that come in and help them. We provide all the resources they're gonna need. Wow. So, and then if they have their high school degree or a diploma or a GED, then we say, well, what kind of extra education now beyond could you do to be able to earn a, you know, a better living? We, if they're working at a $9 an hour job and they come in, we usually ask them to quit that job really? and full time prepare for a job that could earn a living wage uh, because you're stuck. Yes. If, you're, if you're spending your 40 hours a week plus transportation time and you've got kids at home, it's just really difficult to go get further job training or education so that you could earn a better wage. So opportunity. Um, that's amazing. Yeah. So there we've had them go through cosmetology, uh, medical coding and billing, EKG phlebotomy, um, gosh, a number of different kind of job training programs. So, you know, in six to 12 months, depending on what it is, they could get that certificate and become licensed in a field. Massage therapy is another one. I'm thinking of all the people we know. Yes. Okay. Medical assisting. Um, you know, or if they could go to our local community college, uh, we would encourage that. So it depends on their, each individual situation. Every single situation is different. So one freshman does not look like another freshman. Sure. You know, if you have a lot of trauma in your background, we're not going to want you to work at all for a while and just rest and get counseling and, and learn who God is and learn about forgiveness and starting over. Uh, maybe you have legal issues. We have volunteer attorneys that will come help do pro bono work to help you get something expunged off your record that's holding you back or deal with a, you know, something in, in your past. Um, so it's a, a whole you know, encompassing 360 degree program. Yes. So whatever it is, you might have medical issues that you need to deal with and you can't work until you've got your medical situation figured out. Uh, your kids might have a medical situation and you haven't no been able to get them stable. We'll come along and have people come in and do that. So every single person's different uh, and every journey is different. We, uh, we've had people stay longer than two years. But we've also had, you know, somebody graduate our program within six months. Wow. Okay. So we had somebody who was about to get their PhD in physical therapy, who her husband left her. She had all this debt and didn't know it. She had nowhere to go, no family in the area or in the country, I think. Oh my but uh, so she came and lived with the life, just fell apart. And we were able to give her a little time. And then she was able to go back and finish her final internship, the, the last semester or whatever it was, uh, for her PhD, and now she's a physical therapist in the area. And one of our former staff people had a shoulder surgery and went in, and she was her physical the therapist. therapist. Oh, that's so amazing. We're seeing these people in the community. I called a law firm recently uh, and to talk to a, a donor, and I said, Well, this is Stacia Glavis with, well, then it was Brevard Rescue Mission. Mm -hmm. She said, Stacia, this is, and said her name, and I went, Oh my <laughs> gosh, how are you? <laughs> She was one of our graduates is their main receptionist. So That's it's incredible. really cool seeing them. So we really are transforming their entire life. So it's not just, it was definitely not a handout and it's more than a hand up too. I mean, we're, because we're also holding them accountable. Yes, so I this is a unique thing about our program is that they have to keep making progress to stay in the program. So we provide everything they need. They don't need a job. We'll literally provide everything they need until they're working. And then when they start working, they pay 30% into a program fee. They get, and, and they work every week. Uh, well, every, every student and sometimes even more often and sometimes then later as you become a junior or senior, it's once a month with a financial coordinator that's on our staff who's a certified Dave Ramsey coach. Yes, Financial, she's me financial yeah. Peace University. Yes, yes. excellent. She's meeting with them. So they're really learning how to manage their money. Every single week they say what they spent, what they're gonna spend the next week. We have a savings program that we match their savings when they graduate up to $1,000. It's 50 cents on the dollar. So say, if they save $2,000 while they're with us, 
we'll give them a thousand dollars on top of that when they graduate. So then that's enough to help get their first and last month's rent to get stable. And then we can help do a housewarming, you know, and help furnish their apartments. And, and then we stay involved. Our case, our graduates can always reach back to us for case management anytime they need it. Uh, and so it's a long-term life-changing experience. Oh man. And that is definitely something that, now first I want to clarify, these are, your students are only women, right? Yes. They are homeless women with children, correct? Children. And homeless is a, also a relative term. It means that either they're, they're, they don't have a lease of their own and a place of their own. So they might be living on someone's couch, um, you know, or, or have one month left at somebody's house that they've been living with who's now they don't have anywhere else to go. They might, you know, be um, evicted and, you know, had a place they're not quite, so they're not necessarily homeless yet, but they're going to be if we don't take them in. Or they might be living in their car or a tent and they could be second or third generation homeless. So it's a wide range. Okay. And these are Brevard County women, right? I mean, Brevard these are not, not people you're hearing about it's somewhere exactly. else, right? That's a world away right in our own here. backyard. Mm -hmm. So the numbers, and I can't remember, um, this is not the exact number, but over the years, we've had roughly 1,500 school-aged children in Brevard County identified as homeless. Oh. In the description, in the way that I just explained, not living on their own, don't have their own place. So it, and that's school age children. And a lot of the women that come to us have younger children, even than that. So there could be, you know, three or 4,000 possibly in Brevard County, you know, of 600,000 people. And this is a relatively affluent community. But, uh, and what's interesting this year, you're probably going to ask this, but our numbers have not in, our calls have not really increased much this year. Okay because of the eviction thing that is been put on hold. Mm. My fear is that when that is, when evictions are allowed again, we're going to get a lot more calls. Okay. And how many residents or students can you house at one time right now? What's your capacity? Right now, 21 families. Actually, it's 19 families. We're not quite done with two more of the cottages. So yeah, that's what we can do. And we're always looking at expanding. We got something that's brewing, another possibility that we're working on that I can't tell you about yet. <laughs> we'll be able to soon. Uh, but we have three campuses. So we have a 12 unit apartment complex. Well, it's really eight units and four of them we use as kids club and uh, staffing and meeting space. And then another one's a five unit complex. And then we just opened what we call the Life Transformation Center on US-1 that's eight single family cottages and then five commercial buildings. So that's where all of our staff are. That's where our classes are. That's where we keep the kids when the moms are in classes. So that's another piece we have <clears throat> of the program, not only just the one-on-one -on -one case management that they get daily or hourly at first is, and then they work with a financial coach, but then we have this kids club and life skills program. So two nights a week and Saturday mornings, all the moms are in classes. So once a week, it's Bible study, and the other time is a life skill. So whether it's parenting, money management, nutrition and health, um, and sorry, Karen, our volunteer coordinator, I can't remember the fourth, <laughs> the one that goes through the cycle. And then we do a fifth, there's a fifth week, they do something creative with them. Uh, and so, and then we have, so while those moms are in those classes, the kids then have kids club. So we need lots of volunteers for kids club. And with COVID, it's been very difficult to have volunteers. So if you've already had COVID and it come through it fine on the other side, we'd love to have you guys <laughs> here. Or if you're just willing and able, you know, to be around kids, um, we do have staff for that, but we really need lots of volunteers to love on those kids in the evenings. Absolutely. Oh, wow. Such an incredible program. And I think that that was, I've often heard you talk about, you know, we've all heard teach a man to fish, feed him or give him a fish, feed him for a day, teach him to fish, feed him for a lifetime. And I know that that is exactly what you're doing. And I feel like had you not listened again to that tug on your heart, it would have been so easy to give Julia some money, you know, to yeah. kind of set up a little bit and survive for right now. And, oh, let me get you back on your feet for, like you said, a month, right? But God's like, you know what? I want you invest and it just became this 
And what we love about it, when I say we, like Tim and I just, we were looking for somewhere where our family could be involved when we first found you guys, because at the time we found you guys, our children were much younger. It was probably four years ago. And a lot of places will not let young children volunteer, which is understandable. But you guys were like, yeah, we'll give you something to do. And I told them, we don't want to hold babies. We want to get dirty. And we had our kids in the nasty yard out behind one of the places that was being renovated, pulling out old tricycles and washing them. And it was awesome. And that just led down the path of many other ways we've been involved with you guys. But what we loved was just that. It's a full program. And these women, it's total life transformation. It is not come in, let's give you a bed and fill your bellies, you know, and tell you it's going to be okay. We'll pray for you and send you back. And there's a time and a place for that. But that, and that's what I want you to talk about. If you wouldn't mind when these women come to you, when they identify you, they find you, you find them, they have to make a commitment, right? To actually become part of this program, because there's a lot of accountability in this program. They do. And it's not easy. And, you know, these are adult women and in some ways it can make you feel like you're a child again or moving back with your mom who tells you that there's curfews and you have to keep your apartment clean and they're going to check it each week. Uh, you've got to be at work or studying for work or volunteering from nine to five. So, um, but it's, it's a program and, and, but it's going to change your life forever. So for, you know, six months to two years, tough it out, you know, let somebody else have some guidance over you. If you're in this situation, it's because you're missing something. And yeah, you might not be missing. Maybe you are a very disciplined person and now you got to go, you know, be in it by curfew and that's mm-hmm. kind of ridiculous. But really your issue is something else. But because we're helping everybody at the same time, everybody's got to follow through the same kind of system, you know. So yeah, they've got a sign that they're doing this and every week they're meeting with their case manager and moving forward on their case plan. So it's not easy, but it's, it takes humility. So if you're humble, it's not that hard. Cause if you just say, you know, I'm just doing this for a while. I know, you know, I can't smoke or drink on property and I can't bring mail overnight guests, you know, that's a no, no, you know, you can't have guests pop in and out. We have to have permission and, you know, know who's on property and it is confidential addresses. You can't release the address. So, you know, there's some things. But you're getting a chance to change your life and your children's life and your grandchildren's life. Yes, it's so empowering. And that's what I always say. I, act, I admire the students because these women are taking a step. You said it takes humility. It takes strength. It takes meekness, right? It takes strength under control. Yep. It takes dying to self, right? And taking that step. And it's a huge step and it's a huge commitment. But you're looking for the down the road, generations and generations. And it is incredible to see the impact. And now you guys have been in, is it 11, 12 years now? Mm -hmm. And you're seeing, yeah. Okay. You're seeing the fruits, right? Right. You're seeing the children and the children and you're seeing some of those children now are in college. And one of our, we love one of our our kids that was there, who was uh, about 14 when she got there and had a little brother. Her mom's awesome. We're still in touch with them. She was able to graduate high school with her AA, then went and then transferred to UCF and got her bachelor's in two years and is now working at Health First and they're paying for her master's degree. Wow. Or health administration, I can't remember which. And that was a kid who they were homeless when she came. Incredible. And so she's awesome. We're so proud of that family. And I could just tell you story after story like that. But that that's mom what took trying that. to do is to change the generations. Yes. You're breaking that cycle. Oh, it's incredible. I love it. All right. Let's see what else I have on this list. I don't want to leave anything out. It's so good. You mentioned so much of it already. And what's your success rate? Well, of those that graduate from our program, it's over 90%. We haven't done the percentages in a while, so it could be significantly higher than that, but we know it's over 90% have been able to stay employed and stay housed and moving forward. So that's huge. That is really um, huge. That um, it's permanent change. Yeah. You know, then there's those few that have life has just hit them another curveball. And that's why we tell them, reach back to us. If you get another curveball, let us help you through it. Don't dig it deeper and deeper. Let's stop it at the, you know, let's see if we can help you. And things happen. And if you're out there as a single mom, all single moms know, if you don't have a, net, a support network, it's hard. Uh, when, when things, you know, you get that something out of left field. Yeah, like a pandemic. 
like a pandemic <laughs> or a job loss or a health issue. Yeah. You know, those things happen. So, you know, I don't want to say that the 10% were failures, you know, either because sure. you know, they just had some hard things. And uh, so, yeah, so it's, it's a tremendous, if, and we do have a certain percentage, I don't know what the number is, that leave our program before they graduate because they don't want the oversight or we're tough on them. And we say, you can't not make progress for three or four weeks. That's not allowed. We need your spot for somebody else. So you either got to get with it or you need to move out. And sometimes they'll choose to move out. Maybe they want to go back to an old boyfriend or, you know, and, it, and it's a shame because it's, it's a, I don't know the numbers either, but it's amazing how many of them come back again and say, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have left. But we say, we tell you from the very beginning, if you leave, you can't come back because it's, it's, if, they would be leaving and coming back all the time. Yeah. It's like a parent. If you're not consistent, <laughs> yeah. right. If you don't lay down rules and stick to your boundaries, you're not going to get the fruit that you're looking for. And your program would not have the success rate it does if you were so lax and so easy, because that's what it takes is that commitment. So I know that's not easy. And it takes someone like you, Stacia, who has the big okay. heart, but also has that, you can draw that line. You yeah. know, you can be tough when you need to. It, it takes a lot of us to be able to do that. And oh. I'll tell you, that's the hardest part of this. That's and exactly my next thing. The hardest things of this is telling somebody no to begin with, that we can't accept you into our program because they've got too many issues or whatever it is. And then the, the harder one is to say you have to leave and, you know, oh, it's just terrible. But you have to hold, you have to have the boundaries. And that's and why the success is there. Yeah. Well, so I would imagine that an operation of this magnitude with so many moving parts can not be inexpensive to run. <laughs> so can you just speak a little bit, what does it take to keep New Life Mission going? Absolutely. So um, glad you asked that. One thing that's also unique about us is that we don't take any government money. So a lot of organizations like ours are funded through government programs and grants. We decided early on that part of our philosophy is to help people get off of government assistance and to support themselves. And so that's really our philosophy. So we thought, well, then we don't want to take government money and support our organization and depend on the government. And then the other thing is I come from a business background. And so I like to, to run things, this is an odd term too, but like a business in terms of more like an entrepreneur, I would say, is more agile. We can decide if something's working, we can change it. If yes, something's not working, have more control. we can pivot easily. We can make decisions quickly, where if you have a grant, you know, you, and you may wait six months till you're even going to get, you know, to apply. And then you find out you get it. You've got to spend it within six months. Then you've got to report back and it's got to be spent exactly that way. So we just decided early on that we weren't going to compete with other nonprofits that were depending on that money and that kind of thing. So every dollar we spend is raised by donations. Wow. So that involves, um, individuals, you know, we've got monthly donors that give anywhere from, I think we actually even have a $5 a month donor. I know we've had a $10 a month for many, many years, all the way up to $600 a month uh, that people just faithfully give every single month. And that is a, a great, great part of our support. Then we have uh, Impact 100, which is people that give $100 a month or more or $1,200 a year or more. And that's a group of people called, that we call the Impact 100. And once a year, we have an event that's just for them. It's coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, where we kind of give them the state of the state. They get to hear directly from a student, tell their story. I, they're the first to kind of find out what's going to happen next. They're the ones we rely on to give us good feedback. So um, th those people are real important to our organization. And then we have uh, corporate, corporate support for different things. And then uh, civic clubs and then churches support us monthly. We've got quite a few churches that either give to us monthly or once a year, or at least they send volunteers on a regular basis. So we've got quite a bit of church support. So it comes from a lot of different directions. And then we have our, our one annual event that was Women Who Care Share Now that is now Community Care and Share. So I don't know if you're going to talk about that later, or if you want to address that. It'll be talked but, about plenty of times, but why don't you at least give us an intro to what Community uh, Care and Share been, is? It started out as a women's luncheon uh, 10 years ago. I was trying to figure out how to raise money. And my sister said, hey, why don't you ask... Ten, she'd been to something in, out in her state. She said, why don't you get 10 women to bring nine of their friends? That'd be 100 people and ask them all to give $100. And that'd be $10,000. Wow. 
And I thought, wow, that's a great idea. So we did it at the country, at the O'Galley Yacht Club. We had a hundred okay. people the first year. We asked him to give a hundred dollars that they raised ten thousand dollars. And then we had somebody sponsor the lunch for it was fifteen hundred dollars or something. So we netted almost the ten thousand dollars. So this is a good idea. So <laughs> then we did the next year we had two hundred women and then we moved it. It got too big for the yacht club, so we moved it to Hilton. 300 women, then 400 women, 450, and then that's the, the biggest room. And then two years ago, we, on our 10th anniversary, we did two days of luncheons. So we had 800 women come for that luncheon. And you, we don't pay tickets, they don't buy tickets. We just, you get invited or you say you wanna come. Uh, we put you with the hostess and then we tell you the story and ask for you to pray about what God wants you to give. So it's not $100 a person anymore. It's where's God speaking to you? So some people may only be able to give 50, but there's others that give 10,000 every year at that event and a lot give 1,500. And then some people sponsor the event for 1,200 and up to $25,000. So that's that's our huge signature event. And it's it's an event. And we last year we had to go online, of course, because it was in April, and but it was phenomenal. We raised as much money as we ever had. And, but God brought the right people and, you know, spoke to some people who could give more, knowing that there was a lot that couldn't give anything. So it, God's providence, you know, his math worked out. So, you know, we're going to do yet a different kind of approach this year that we're really excited about. We're always doing kind of the edgy, new, new kind of approach to things. Sure. Our team is amazing. Our volunteers and our staff that put all these things together, they are creative and um adventurous and <laughs> it's really cool to see god working through so much talent that's awesome and we are definitely we're this is the very beginning of a series where we're going to be doing more talking about new life mission and what is going on in our community right now and we will be speaking more about community care and share event but like stacia said we are taking it completely online, but be hosted in small gatherings or through Zoom meetings by people all over, not just the county, but really the country, right? Yeah. I mean, people anywhere Absolutely. now can sign up to host one of these events and benefit yes. this incredible ministry from wherever you are through Zoom right. on your couch or in your living room with a few friends. And I know we even have some churches that are going to be holding brunches for, you know, yep. limited amount of people at tables where they can show this event, stream it live, and then women can women and men now, right? It's no longer just right. women. It's the whole community exactly. can get involved and really be part of this incredible ministry and having this impact that's changing lives and generations to come. That's so great. Stacia, I love it. I love everything you're doing. Um, if someone is listening and they are wondering about these services, whether they feel like maybe for themselves or for someone they know, maybe this service is something that they are interested in finding out more about, how would they start that process? Uh, that's great. So our website is www.newlife-mission.org. So don't forget the dash, newlife-mission.org. And our website just has everything. It's got all of our old newsletters, our annual reports, even our financials are online. Uh, if you can learn about the programs and if you have somebody that needs help, they can apply right online. Okay. I can't remember if it probably says apply or I need help or something. I don't remember the tab, but it's right there. Uh, and then we'll get back to them as soon as they answer all those questions online. Uh, we have a lot of information on our website. You can click through and ask about how to donate. Uh, you can also donate right online monthly. Uh, you could do a recurring gift. So it just comes out of your you know, checkbook once a month or on a credit card. Uh, we, re we redid that last year, our whole website. So it's very user-friendly and it's got videos. I'd encourage your people to go look at the videos. The oh media. yeah, I will link to that. I'm gonna have all of these links in the show notes for sure. So all anyone listening needs to do is right. Go down to those show notes and click on there. You'll find the link to apply. You'll find the link to donate if you want, but just to learn more. And we will definitely put the links to some of those videos because they are so powerful and so impactful. And they really let you see where your gifts, your time, and your prayers are going. Um, and so, yeah, that. so does someone have to be local to be involved? That was my next question. If you're anyone listening is feeling a tug on their heart. And I know for us, we want to be involved in the work the Lord is doing and we want to help but sometimes because we also want to be good stewards and I feel like it is our responsibility as followers of Christ when we are blessed, we're blessed to be a blessing, mm -hmm. but we need to examine where we're sending our money or yes. spending our time, right? 
That's great. We actually are accredited with the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability, ECFA. That's a great stamp of confidence when you're looking at Christian organizations. Uh, to do that every year, we, we upgrade, we, they make sure that your board is handling things well, that your finances are all managed, that they're protected, um, <clears throat> that everything is transparent, the, uh, just a lot of things to make sure that the organization is strong and legitimate, of course. Um, you know, and sometimes people like to sponsor somebody, you know, we think about overseas missions, but there's missions right here in America. The, this is mission work right here. And we are getting people that support us all over the country now that like this model. And we're hoping to be able to continue to grow and eventually share with what we're doing with other people so that this kind of movement can continue in other communities. Um, but if we are only accepting right now people from as students or residents in our program, either from Brevard County or they have a connection to Brevard County. So maybe it's a grandmother that lives here in Brevard County and their granddaughter is somewhere out, we would probably, we would, well, we would interview her, not necessarily accept her, but we would interview her if she was then going to stay in Brevard County. So this is a local, locally supported, you know, organization. So uh, United Way does support us. So right now we are just serving students that have a connection to Brevard County. Sure. And if there's someone listening who maybe they're thinking, I don't really have money, but my heart is being drawn to this and I want to get involved. What is the option for those people? Go on our website and say, I uh -huh. want to help. There is a volunteer link. It'll take you to Karen, who is our volunteer coordinator and life skills coordinator. She will find out your gifts and your skills, your abilities, what your interests are. And she will tie you in, whether it's cleaning old tricycles or working in a garden or uh, painting, or keeping children, or teaching a class, or offering transportation, or helping with accounting, or doing an event. That it's unlimited the kind of things that you can do. Yes. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. And and your kids can get involved too. And yes, it is a mission field in our own backyard. And that right. is definitely something that we are so thankful for because, like you said, foreign missions is wonderful and it's right. necessary. But not everyone is able to do that or called to right. do that. And right. then to know that this is right here, right here and right now, right? Mm -hmm. So is there anything we didn't mention that you are chomping at the bit that we need to say? You'd ask me about a life verse or kind of a verse. Yes, that's my final question. Scripture. Yeah, do you have uh, a life verse or one that's really bringing you life right now? You know, one of the, the first verses I memorized in, as a teenager probably was Hebrews 11, one. And of course I memorized it from the King James version back in that day. <laughs> Most oh. of us did, I think. <laughs> uh, but you know, faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. And I just love to, the, I love the word evidence and that's not, that word isn't always used in uh, newer translations, but that, that faith is evidence of things not seen. We believe you know, to me, having faith in God uh, and faith that Jesus is going to move mountains. I was praying this morning for a men's ministry here in our county. They have 300 men gathering together uh, for an event, and many of them are not believers and don't have any background. And I thought, wow, I was just praising God for that victory. Uh, so, and I was just, and in my prayer, I was believing. I was picturing these men walking forward and turning their lives over to the Lord and changing their families. And it's it, that I have faith in that, and I believe, and that's evidence that it's going to happen. And so that's just something that that I always go back to is that Hebrews eleven one. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Good stuff. And I can never mention that verse without mentioning that hope. I think for our American minds, the word hope is a poor translation of the original text, right? Because it's it's a confident knowing. Yeah. It's not a, a wishful thought. You know, right. when we hear hope as Americans, we're like, oh, I hope it happens. No, this is, Jesus is my hope. He is my confidence. He is what I know is going to happen, right? And so I know think that, that, that. I know that I know. I love yeah, that. know that I know that I know. <laughs> know in your knower. I heard, <laughs> I heard somebody say that once. That must have been a Bible Belt Southern Baptist term. <laughs> But yes. Oh, man. So there's so much power in that. Stacia, thank you for sharing. Thank you for talking with us today. And this is called the Intertwined Life Podcast. And I think you seamlessly live that out, our walks with the Lord and our everyday lives being seamlessly intertwined. And your your life and your story is a perfect example of that. Do you have a, a little funny or silly or focused tip for our listeners maybe on how to really intertwine their lives in just everyday stuff? Gosh, um, I don't know if I'm, I'm not very funny. <laughs> That's but, okay. Not everybody is. But I think of, 
the J-O-I, Jesus, others, and yourself. Hmm. I think, you know, we, we've heard that, that that's how you should live. Put Jesus first, then others, then yourself. And I really feel like in today's Christianity, we're really putting ourselves a lot first, even above Jesus. We're like so focused on what we can learn and what we're doing and what we believe and what we think. And then weaving in what God says into what we think. Hmm. And hmm. then if there's extra time, we focus on others. And especially this past year with all the hatred and division and, you know, let's start with Jesus and then others and then ourselves, yes. you know, let's go Jesus. And it's a quick jump from Jesus to others because he was all about others. Yeah. You know, a lot of that stuff, when we read in the Bible, it was writ written corporately and we take it personally. Like, oh, this is what Jesus is saying for me to do. Jesus was saying the whole, all of you need to do this. So, you know, and so you look at the whole picture, you step back, it's Jesus is, is first of all, how does the world need to be? What do we need to do for others? What, what's our part in helping other people? And then it's ourselves, you know, then we're, we're last and life just works out better that way. And it makes Jesus really happy. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. We take care of others and God takes care of us. Right. That's so good. All right. I love it. Thank you so much, Stacia, for joining us today. This was definitely something I had on my bucket list for the podcast. So thank you. Thank you. so fun. And I love your podcast and I wish thank you well. Thank you so much. For all Bye. your support. Absolutely. All right. Talk to you soon. Okay, guys, I hope that you enjoyed that. And please don't forget to check out the show notes. We have links to everything that Stacia and I mentioned, but there's also links to every scripture verse that we referenced in today's show. So it's like a Bible study within itself. So I challenge you, get in there, dig into those scripture, check out those links. If you feel led to get involved in any way whatsoever, head to www.newlife-mission.org or click on the link in the show notes. I promise you their incredible team of volunteers and amazing staff will be more than willing and happy to help you find ways that you can use your gifts and your passion to impact lives for generations to come. And please be sure to head back next Wednesday. Go on down there and subscribe so you don't have to remember to check. And you're going to hear next week from Miss Anne-Marie Britt. She is currently the Director of Development for New Life Mission. But before that, she was a foster mom in Colorado, and she adopted two of her beautiful children out of homelessness. And her story is so powerful and so raw as we get to see homelessness from that child's perspective. And I know that you're going to love what Amory has to share with us because not only is it heartfelt and maybe could be a tearjerker, there is joy and power on the other side of this story and it's beautiful to hear. So come back next week, catch that one. And don't forget today is just part one in a five part series and keep tuning in with us because in a few weeks, we are actually going to be talking to one of the current students at New Life Mission. She's living there right now. She's going through the program right now. And her story of how God met her while she was incarcerated, laid it on her heart to take a step towards freedom, a step towards getting out of that lifestyle, how it led her to New Life Mission. And now the transformation that she has seen in her life, as well as the life of her children, amazing. You do not want to miss this. So I look forward to continuing on this journey with you. Thanks so much. Hey friend, if you enjoyed this episode and you got some good stuff out of it, there's a few options you have. One, you could click that little subscribe button because let's be honest, who's got time to remember to check back and see if there's a new episode, right? So click that subscribe button and then when a new episode comes up, it will just by the magic of the internet pop up in your Dropbox and it'll be right there for you whenever you're ready. And also, if you would review this podcast, oh my gosh, if you like what you heard, get on there, give it a five-star review. If you didn't like what you heard, just pretend it never happened, okay? <laughs> but if you would do um, a review for me, just take a couple seconds and do that. Not only would I be crazy excited, but also it would just be a great way for us to partner together for you to help this podcast be seen by more women out there. And you could be a part of helping more women discover these practical ways to apply God's word to just everyday stuff. So I would love it, love it, love it if you could help me out in one of those two ways.